Hello everybody, this is another part of our Minecraft plugin tutorial series. Today is a bit different because we're going to be dealing with lag, reading stack traces, and most importantly, dealing with crashes of the server. This is when everything else has failed and the server has completely hung up. Plus, I'm going to also be giving you the best tips to optimizing lag and finding lag. I have been dealing with different plugins for the last 11 years, and in just the last two, three years, we have closed over 2,400 tickets for just one plugin, Chat Control Red, and its previous edition, Chat Control Pro, we did close 2,370 tickets as well. Uh, if I, I'm not going to count all the tickets for all the other plugins, but it's probably more than six or 7,000 tickets. So, pretty good at this. I'm not gonna brag. Please make sure to listen, stick to the very end, and you will understand so much more about your server, even if you are already know how to deal with it on a basic level. First of all, pretty much the, the entire paper or Spigot server runs on the main thread. This is where, say, 80% of things are running. And if you, you don't understand the server heartbeat, please refer back to the first video that we have in this series. I'm not gonna repeat myself here. I explain what the heartbeat is. And the problem is with this one, plugins are also run here. And let's say they do ha that you have a single bad plugin. Well, the entire operation is gonna come right here. And then it has to wait for the crappy plugin to move forward and keep going into the next ticking cycle. There are, of course, different threads uh, for the server. I think one deals with packets, another one deals with the chat. And I think nowadays even chunks are multi-threaded, but still the vast majority just relies on the main thread. So this is where the main majority of the lag comes from. Now, first thing I'm gonna show you is how to read a basic stack trace. Of course, people mostly, mostly know about this. So I pulled out a little bit more complicated one just to make sure that you understand it fully. It is super crucial. Stack trace in Java simply means that there is a problem somewhere inside the code, and then it prints out the origin of the code, and then it keeps printing out where the previous line is being called. So for example, this one, it complains that there's an illegal argument exception. This is the actual class in Java, and then this is the message. So attempt to get blah, 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 field, illegal data type conversion, whatever that means. So again, this one is the class, and that one is a message. That, that one is actually not super helpful, so we have to look at the stack trace itself. That one is sometimes displayed to indicate, especially if you're using a newer version of Java than Java 8, such as Java 20, it often says the location inside the package, or it can even point out to a specific jar file. In this case, you can see it right here. We have the chat control right here. Now, thing is, this one does not show it, right? And I honestly would not bother too much about this because you can obviously just um, read the same plugin name from the package name, which comes second. So that one is the package name, that one is the package name, that one is the package name. Until we, we come to the final thing of it, which is the class. And then this one, the little, the little dollar symbol is that that is actually another class within that class. If I open up my code, we have a demo class and inside the demo class, we have demo two class. Well, if there is a problem somewhere in this class, it is going to be looking as demo right here, dollar sign one. This is just how it works in Java. Understand that, take note if you didn't. So that's first thing. Again, it reads like newspaper. So the code ended up malfunctioning here in the unsafe field accessor implementation. And I know that this comes from Java itself and there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. So we have to dive deeper. So this was called from this line and this was called from the, this line and then the get int method in the field itself called this one, right? So we're going to go deeper until we find somewhere, something where we can work with. And now I can see that another part of the stack trace is actually another plugin, which is called placeholder API and is dealing with something to do with requesting expansions. And then we can see that a huge chunk of code has to deal with my own plugin. So if you see your own plugin, obviously it's a good idea to start looking at what is going on here. So set placeholder, hook manager is the class, and then this one is the exact line number. Now, if I have a look at chat control, we can see that there isn't such a package such as lib.model, and there isn't a class called hook manager. This is because inside our palm file, what we're doing, we're actually using an, another API called the foundation. And then down here, I'm actually 
moving all the packages from the foundation inside orgmine academy chat control that lib so pay attention to that if you are a plugin developer that is why this is only the relocated library and then we have to find the hook manager class in the actual library itself now of course if you do not have access to that library you're out of luck, you have to speak with their developers, but if you are the author of your library, obviously you can then find the class. This is the class and this is the line. It's a little bit weird because this line actually points out to an empty location, which means probably that my plugin has updated and I've placed something above the class pushing everything down if that's the case you can ask the user if they use the latest version if not don't provide them support because you're just going to be you're just going to be wasting your time if you're using an obfuscator then you can probably have a look inside your obfuscator on how to de-obfuscate the, tr the stack trace and also make sure not to mess up with the line numbers inside your obfuscation. I know it's going to make the obfuscation more stronger at the expense of you not being able to find where things are. We can also, as last resort, look at this method right here on request. And I know that the set placeholder method inside my hook manager, which is right here, it's either this one or that one or maybe some, maybe not this one. So it has to be called set placeholder, right? So it's somewhere here, some, somewhere here. But we know that another one is called on request and we know that inside the set placeholder, we are calling on request. So I can just have a look and find the on request and we can see that it's being called right here inside the set placeholder method, which makes complete sense. So now what I can do is I can de deduce that we're going into another placeholder and I can't fix the book because this is my code right here and I don't have control over what's going on inside on request, right? And this is what screws a lot of people up because they're confused about where the code comes from, especially if you're dealing with like multiple dependencies. So that's why I'm trying to explain to you. The conclusion of this is obviously con contacting the user to then report to the player expansion that there's a problem with it attaching the entire report. So the user had then copy this, send it to their developers, and they have to fix that. It also means that there is probably something to do with ping. If you read it, you'll notice that we're trying to replace a player-related expansion because it says player expansion. I'm, I'm just deducing using common sense. And then we're trying to retrieve the player's ping, getting the ping, and then it's trying to access a bunch of Java things, which apparently we don't have any permission for, and we're running Java 17. I know as a developer that Java... 11 and Java 15 or 14 has increased the security of using reflection and it's now actually harder to access fields inside Java. I do not fully understand this code. I could probably work myself around it if I would be in the developer, if I could look directly at what this code does, what this, sorry, this code right here does, but I can't. So we're officially done. We have diagnosed it. We found that this is not my issue at the end and the user has to then request support from that plugin. The second thing, what happens if the main thread is blocked? You're going to end up with something called a crash. For example, I found a beautiful crash right here and the user has sent me the full starter block. So the way that we are going to be looking for these crashes, hopefully they are at the very bottom and we can just keep scrolling up. Yeah, and here we can see do not report this to Purper. User is using Purper. And now we can have a look at the beautiful crash report. So it actually starts right here. The server has not responded. And I can maybe just copy this line. And I can try to find the top most occurrence. There we go. So it's right here. So the way you deal with a crash report is you read the entire console. You read, sorry, you read the entire relevant part of the console, not the entire log. And then you have to understand that for every thread, it is going to dump what the thread is doing at the exact time of the crash. So again, we're going to be seeing this dump from the main thread, then probably from all bunch of other threads too, at the exact time of the crash where the, where the computer is at. So let me start with the first thread. This is the server thread, the main thread of the server. We can see again, we are not inside any plugin. We're actually dealing with Google library. So we keep scrolling down until we find net.md5, which I know it's a library dealing with chat right here. And then we can actually find a culprit. Oh my God, it's my own plugin, right? And so what we can do right here to legacy text, I can open up the class and I can see that I'm calling component serialize.parse. And then I can just 
keep scrolling to get a full understanding of what's going on. And I'm going to stop right here because that's all that I need. If I go and I look at any other threads, you can actually see that these are very, um, very much the same. This one does not even have my plugin in it. Yeah. Okay. So there's only two. This one does not have my plugin. And then if there is no your plugin there, then there's a high chance that the crash report is irrelevant to your plugin. Obviously, test by removing it if you can reproduce it. But what I can do is I can deduct that we are dealing with protocol lib and my plugin is then connecting to protocol lib, is trying to read um, the chat message that is being sent and it's trying to decompile the chat message. The reason for this is that since micro 1.7.10, every simple chat message is not as simple and there's a lot of different components into it and we have to convert it into a text, which then chat control, my plugin can evaluate, can change a little bit. And then we have to, to do a back conversion from the text. It's called JSON back into a component, which is then sent as a packet, super complicated takes a lot of time and now you can see that it took more time than it should and the server stopped responding. The conclusion from this ticket will actually surprise you. So I found through rigorous testing that the user had many plugins that were sending customized gradients and a whole bunch of other stuff that created the message that was super, super long. And then the user had a lot of different rules on chat control. Every single rule is evaluating the text. And then we have to compress the text back now, this entire process took longer than it should. So the solution from this ticket was simple. I advise the user to reduce the amount of rules that they have, which, you know, seems like, okay, great. Your plugin is what? Is it slow? No, but it's simply a matter of physics. If you have 300 different rules, there's not much I can do because every single rule has to be evaluated. So again, it was pretty tricky. That's why I wanted to, to explain how I think behind it. It's more so you have to understand your stuff. You have to be responsible developer. That's why I have a lesson about clean code, coding standards, because if you write clean, you're able to understand it so much more easily. And then it's about understanding this as a whole. So using your common sense, right? I'm not going to say intuition, but using common sense, you're going to see, okay, we're dealing with packets. Then we're dealing with decompression of packets. And then you simply ask the user, you know, what, which plugins do you have? How, what, do you remember like the last couple of messages before that happened? And they're going to send you the messages and then maybe you can have a debug so that when you call this right here, actually right before you call it, you're going to save the message, which you are about to decompress into an external file, which you can then read and the user can send it to you. And you're going to see, oh my goodness, there is gigantic messages from, I don't know which plugin. And obviously that is causing issue. Another solution could be, I could just add an exemption for that specific plugin to ignore messages from it. Now, the third part of this video is how to actually resolve lag. For this reason, I do recommend guys, you get Spark Profiler. It is an amazing solution for Minecraft, client servers, proxies, you name it. I'm not going to give you the full documentation. Please read the doc, just Google Spark Profiler. You'll be amazed how easy it is to use. And I recommend you run it on a live production server. You let it run for a couple of hours and then you let it produce something looking like this one. So here you can actually see a good example of a profile which has been sent to me by a user. And the way you're gonna deal with this is you first of all, check how long the profile has been running, which is right here. MSPT says 44.44 minutes. Obviously, if the user has been running this for 60 seconds, that's not enough. It's supposed to be at least 10 minutes. Okay, so that one is good. Now, what you wanna do, you wanna click on plugins, and then you wanna look at these plugins, these are sorted from the heaviest plugin to the lightest plugin. We can see chat control here takes 40% of the entire tick. So that's pretty bad. We have to open it and we have to diagnose it. First things I notice is the database connection. So there is something definitely wrong with the database. I open it and I can see that we're dealing with player cache. So I open it, open up this one. And here I can see that we're dealing with configs. So the mistake that I made as developer, I actually um, exhausted the calls to save configuration for every player. And obviously the user has 150 players. There, there were, there were too many calls to save a file to a disc. This is a very intense operation, which should be done not on the main thread. I did it on the main thread. It was a problem. So I had to fix that. And th thus the performance has improved. I've also simply opened up the player cache in my chat control plugin right here. And I simply made it so if the user is using a database, we're not even going to load the, the configuration because everything 
when it comes to database can be dealt with asynchronously. I do have a video in this very channel how to deal with async stuff. It's called timers. And so you can simply run every operation inside um, such a thing. And then I'm actually going to show you what we do. So this is database class. And here is load mails right here. So I can actually load the entire mail database on a different thread by running this async. And then this is a consumer. So this one will basically invoke the code inside once these emails have been loaded. People ask me, how do you, how do you manage? So you load the emails async, but how do you perform an action after they've been loaded? Well, this is how you call load mails. And then you simply create a new consumer, which is going to then work with the set of emails, which just been loaded. And here you can do stuff right after they have been loaded. And the way you actually do this is you, first of all, you get the results set, right? I'm not going to cover the Java aspect of it. This video is not about databases. I may make a video about databases later on. If you want a video like this, just let me know in the comments. And then once I load it, I simply place all loaded emails in a set. And then at the very, very end, I actually run the sync callback, which is the consumer right here, type accept, and I push the loaded set of emails inside it. And I have to run it on the main thread for safety. So that's how you do it. You run things async, you load it, and then you run things sync, and you force it into a consumer. And that's pretty much it. So that's a little bonus. I didn't plan to show you guys this one, but I know that a lot of people will find it useful. Okay, guys, this is it for this video. If you want to learn more about Minecraft plugins and how to make the server of your dreams, check out Project Orient. This is a full class of seven weeks, which is going to show you everything you need to know to learn Java and code beautiful Minecraft plugins. And the best of all, I am on there twice a week to answer any questions on live calls where you can actually unmute yourself and share your screen. And if you're not happy with it, we also have a 30 day money back guarantee. So there is completely no risk. Check out the link in the video description below and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.